how's you guys' paper doing? So I think on um, well, Wednesday, we'll send maybe, I don't know, either the half or the full time in here. Uh, maybe I'll click on this link and I'll have something to look over and then uh, you can just write down your answers in an email or uh, on paper to all the questions that are on that link. But it's almost a take home test that way there's no there's no time pressure, it'll just be on this link and you can get it to me anytime right before the weekend starts. So I'll only spend like half an hour in here just to answer any questions you might have about it. So the next time will just be like half lecture, half work. So I think there's like four topics today. I'm gonna talk about visual timing games and Assembly instructions. So I think in North, no, in South Korea, they boast that by you know, 2018, I don't know when, arbitrary date in the future, every every hospital is going to have their own robot. Maybe uh, it's going to make their lives more efficient if they have a mechanism that can do some domestic chores. But uh, if you think about what a robot would be, we probably already have them in our house. I mean, people are putting cats on their Roombas. But more particularly, in like the job environment, there's a whole slew of t machine types that are the robots that we, uh, you know, have manual control of. Things sometimes are automated. But just say a forklift. Kind of like a, a robot that's assisting us, an ally. And then in the uh, in the workout sector, if you think how uh, at, at gyms everyone goes and you know, kind of like installs themselves on a treadmill, and in treadmills you even have uh, like arcade style readouts. I'll do like a little graph with LEDs to show you. Well, you're gonna go on this little voyage. Here's the Here's the tensions that we're going to walk through. So like every every step's like a, a one minute phase, and then this this area right here just like walks to the left, and then you, you feel the feedback on your legs and that it's going at that speed. So I mean there are people that do free weights, but most everyone else, and part of the, the enjoyment I guess maybe going to a, a gym is that you all, you all get your own machine, you all get your own ally. And uh, yeah, so more so, it's really hard to find on the internet any examples of people getting themselves hurt by fitness equipment because it's just it's something that they want to conceal so that you buy more fitness equipment. But you always hear about injuries on the job. But keeping it linear, let's, uh, let's go to look at some uh, disassembly art. Because disassembly is kind of the opposite of assembly. And every single thing you buy, uh, it's not assembled, it's going to have instructions.
There's a Dustbuster. Waffle Maker. Toaster, Sandwich Maker, Popcorn Maker. Ooh, Electric Knife. So these copper windings are in everything we buy. There's filthy silicone glues underneath the surface of all the, the shiny sunbeam irons you've ever used. Look at this inner world of, of damage. For coffee maker. Especially on this one right here, they're aligning things. This, you know, an artist, they might enjoy assembling things. And uh, the OCD side of that kind of artist would, would probably want to organize them very, very discreetly, very, very collage like. I'm on the opposite side where I just want to make a big pile of this stuff. But a little uh, subgenre of uh, collage seems to be these days disassembling all of our, our intricate mechanics. Maybe it's, it's comforting to, to organize them in, the, in particular fashions where everything is in its proper place. I think this particular artist, uh, no, maybe not this one. Well, this one's this one's even more interesting of a organization of, of a typewriter. Three bar, three linkage, two linkage, and a, and a stem. Ah, here it is. Yeah, this is the guy. I was attracted to his art because uh, not only does he do the, the OCD organization, but he does still photography, uh, kind of like e explosions of the object. You can imagine this uh, camera instantaneously just deciding that this is a, a more efficient state of organization than the one we're so used to. It's a pretty good throw. You wonder, I, I doubt it's bouncing. Maybe he's uh, dropping stuff from a high height and then having the camera get it when it falls past. This one looks like it's bouncing. He desoldered all of the resistors. I think that's just going too far. When I checked out his website, uh, the landing a year or two ago said uh, it all started in, in kindergarten when the teacher gave me some paint. Yeah, Laughing Squid also uh, referenced Todd McLean, same artist. And then there's this other famous artist who just suspensions of objects in exploded view. And that's usually how this uh, assembly diagrams are in the first place, where they show the object just kind of uh, elevated so that uh, focal axis uh, are, are still in kind of like an assemble. Assemble route, uh, route. Everything's in in, in uh, alignment. It, it'd make uh, reassembly slightly uh, simplified. I think they do this in transformer videos. Part part of the, the thrill of transformers is that they can disassemble themselves. Reassemble themselves.
Damian Ortega is the big name that does these suspensions. That's fine art at that point, not just uh, internet art. Luckily, uh, Todd McLean's also hit up a, a chainsaw. I, I don't know why he wants to desolder these circuit boards, though. Might as well peel the Mylar capacitors, unroll them, if he's going to go that far. He didn't open up the CTR monitor. It's funny to think how far it's worth going before uh, dismantling just isn't worth going farther. But in my art practice, you pretty much have to take everything apart until it has no more name. And then you can rename it. More stuff by Todd. So, if artists are doing disassembly, it's a uh, Almost like they're being kind of like at an embassy where people are uh, interpreters or uh, ambassadors. Kind of like uh, kind of like an ambassador to machine world a little bit, a little bit of an anthropologist. There's a famous movie. I forget if its name is Hans Fritz or something. Fritz Lang. It was a, a silent movie, super old. I don't think I've watched it in its entirety, but uh, black and white. Supposedly it's one of the first movies, aside from, say, Frankenstein, that offered people a technophobia. Uh, trope. And there's this uh, famous, famous goddess figure in the movie, this lady right here. Maybe she was like the motherboard kind of central societal uh, controller. But the tri trip's a little bit more obvious in movies like Frankenstein, where you have uh, someone that uses technology to bring back the dead, kind of like sacrilegious usage of it. And then, of course, Frankenstein didn't really have very good ethics. He didn't have a very good roboticist. I've actually watched Frankenstein. It's kind of funny. He's just kind of like an autistic, uh, a severely autistic guy that uh, just doesn't know how to handle himself socially. So he's just hanging out with a girl at, at some water, and she's like three years old, and he's like seven foot five. And then they're just kind of playing, and all of a sudden he just kind of throws her in the water, thinking he's still playing, and she drowns. So, yeah, you can consider it a little bit of a misinterpretation, but then, of course, they have to lynch him. A little bit of French Lang's movie, obviously, it's like penal colony, repression society, everyone's programmed to appreciate it. Walks in unison, the machine has kind of taken over people's humanity. Uh, historically, back in uh, the UK around the start of the Industrial Revolution, maybe like the 1820s or 1870s. Uh, this guy named Lude was working in the, the weaving tapestry building of factories in the... Oh, for whatever reason, he was just uh, upset with these new machines taking over his job. Maybe, maybe he was just there for the entire uh, usurping, where he used to have a job, and then the next year they, they introduced these automated machines. And then all of a sudden, like, the quality of his life is just worse because he no longer has a job that was stable. He's getting displaced. And uh, they see almost machines as a, an infiltrator of, of their uh, social social status, social position. So the movement of the Luddites was started because this guy particularly he destroyed two weaving looms, uh, some of the auto, new automated ones. 
and it's uh, just kind of a catchphrase for people that are uh, technophobic. But it was originally just a kind of like a, a social workers movement. I was hoping that this was an actual movement, but it was just a, a card in the Steve Jackson game called Illuminati. Uh, the riff, the kites. They're pretty cool, they just smash toasters. I didn't spell it right. In a comic book lore, there's this pretty cool uh, characters in the X-Men series. This particular species is called the Technarchy, and they're just like these uh, mal malicious viruses from outer space. And they, in they infect biological systems. Pretty omnipotent, but pretty uncontrollable. Some other characters along the way. Uh, these are the Fanalaks who were, uh, I think the first one was named as Caliban. These are like completely new ones in the last 10 years. But they have a hive mind, you know, same, same as the Borg, same as Fritz Lang's uh, monotonous workers. Something about being a machine makes it so that you can uh, understand other machines telepathically. But you know, half machine, half human, and uh, har hardly stable. So this uh, next week by Susan Blackmore. I don't know if her means and teams, but supposedly it's the, it's the next one in the line. Where you have like a, a genetic trait that tries to survive through DNA, or you have a, kind of like a myth or a story or a way of life. So, you know, like spiders and humans are genes, kind of. And then maybe like little cats and uh, democracy are memes. But Susan Blackmore wants to talk about teams, which is uh, it's when like a machine starts to want to reproduce itself. And I think it usually hires or uh, coaxes humans into doing it. Her, her best example is uh, toilet paper. In this uh, abstract sense, toilet paper is alive and well, and it's, it's thriving in you know, like 95 to 100 percent of uh, human societies these days. It might have been independent, independently invented a couple of hundred times, but they'll just roll it up and put it next to the toilet, and they're they're, they're good at that. And they'll, they'll keep doing that. But how long will technology survive? How long is it the the easiest path? And uh, in the most worrisome, worrisome uh, contingency, the ones the Ludites were afraid of is that the survival of the machines will offset the survival of humans, or that the human quality of life will go, will go uh, wayside just because of this new instantiated supremacy. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, they, they won't place it like in direct correlation to computer use. But uh, more, more uh, vaguely, generally, they refer to it as like repetitive stress syndrome, repetitive actions leading to uh, kind of like stiffness or physiological uh, damage. It didn't exist before people had office jobs. And now we're just... Uh, Backlogging, trying to go back to the origin of it. We'll get into some uh, Susan, Susan Blackmore in a bit. But if you ever uh, watch the QVC, you're, you're sure to realize that uh, teams are, are, are on for sale. People are trying to convince you of how, how dang amazing 
uh, these new um, modern marvels of, of kinematic uh, activity are. And then you'll put one of these uh, uh, amazing new objects that's for exercise in your house. Supposedly it'll make you more efficiently uh, exercise or something. Here's a, a Korean uh, horse simulator. Kind of strange. But the, uh, the survival of these machines is uh, definitely based on us trying to facilitate our our activity, trying to create new new uh, new motions. And and there's always this uh, this balance between like I don't want to do any work, but I want the work done for me. So they're like. Uh, in, in teaching uh, special ed classes, they have this thing called a assistive technology, where you're going to just have like a computer that's got the ability to read your voice or know where you're looking. And uh, you know, some early technologies like writing, uh, there's a, a famous Plato's dialogue called the, the Phaedion, where uh, I think it might have been like Parmenides or, or some Greek goes and talks to the Egyptian uh, pharaoh and says, you know, if you're going to introduce this reading stuff, I mean, uh, this writing stuff, everyone's memory is just going to go to go to heck. No one's going to be able to remember anything because they're going to be dependent on these assistive uh, technologies. Instead of you going to your memory to find out what happened, you know, you just write it down when it happens, forget it, and then go back to the written word. To, to confirm, you know, go back to the technology to reaffirm what you believe in. So, so most technologies are about simplifying, taking away uh, your autonomy, hopefully uh, instilling it in a mechanism or device that's uh, gonna both, like catapult you forward. And on the, the kinematic side, these, these objects are just hilarious. They're an artist's dream come true that everyone's going to have these strange uh, interactive sculptures in their house. There's a, there's this one and another one called like the lounge chair that are are you know super super relaxed kinds of exercises. And for some reason, this one uh, inspired me because it has pulleys. I grew up with a Nordic track, so it's, it's strange uh, to think, you know, you have, you have pets, but do you have technological pets? Like, which, which pet did you, like, phys physically uh, exercise with when you were young? Which uh, machine pet? Was it this one? No, a Ludite would definitely uh, do a dramatic a uh, sequence where someone got tangled and choked up in one of these ma machines. I was, I was looking on the internet trying to find if, if we've actually gotten to the point where anyone's ever uh, confirmed or, or declared that a machine was malicious. And uh, the only time you're ever going to see that is in uh, recalls. There's a California safety board. It's kind of a fun, fun place to haunt, almost like a, a Reddit. Uh, I think it's just for product safety recalls. So you go to the Computer Product Safety Commission, and they'll just list all of the the teams out there these days that are certainly killing us, uh, you know, bringing us down lately. What machines are are killing us lately? be it from uh, lead paint or choking hazards. A lot of, a lot of machines aren't, aren't able to facilitate children as well as they need to be and kids will just find a way to peel off a bracket, loosen a, a string and then all of a sudden turn, turn something that looks kind of mundane into a, a, a death trap. So there's some, some recent ones. 
could you could you uh, say that um, like ethically these machines are are gunning for uh, us? This coffee maker has an injury ha hazard. Scalding water. Flammability standards. Shock hazards. Lacerations. There was a, a lot of talk a couple years ago when Toyota was going through that situation where people were calling in on the 911 while they were driving because their car was just going 100 miles per hour and they couldn't stop it. The, I mean, Luddite started with the mechanical revolution, the industrial revolution, but lately uh, technophobia has kind of transitioned away from some kind of uh, social stability uh, issue, you know, like economic stability, displacement into something that's more, uh, it's too complicated, and I'm like, a, I'd be afraid of uh, something that can't be understood. You know, you'd have to take a, a couple of senior classes hereabouts on campus in um, computer science to be able to know, you know, even half of what's going on on the motherboard underneath your computer. And people are regular, you know, like regularly just knock knock on the side of the screen of their computer, hoping that it, uh, you know, responds to the same kind of kind of like emotional uh, feedback that uh, you know a, a less mechanical machine would. I, I sure like shaking machines because oftentimes gears just need a little bit of a uh, oscillation before before they can tune tune back into each other's uh, teeth. Yeah, so somewhere around in the, the Product Safety Commission is, a, is one version of, of uh, technophobia. Because it's uh, like OSHA is the other one. That's for uh, an, uh, Occupational Safety Hazards Organization or uh, Association. And it's their job to make all of the statistics for how many people are dying from all the different things that can be killed. And they take it upon themselves uh, to, to sue companies that are making machines or, or safety situations that are uh, you know, just a little a little less than humane for, for people that are just trying to you know bring home a paycheck. So here, here's a pretty wacky machine. I mean, it's just a treadmill a little farther out there. This lady will, will start surfing it. It's pretty pretty funny. Probably a great workout. But machines like this, like no one needs them in their own own home, I, I don't think. I mean, how many how many fitness junkies are there that have like 10 different uh, like full-size sofa, sofa objects in their house that are like electromechanic workout uh, assistants? So people are, are time sharing them, you know, a gym is just a standard thing. It's kind of like a maker factory, but for uh, aerobics rather than creativity. Uh, this, this, uh, this famous guy, I think his name is like Tony Little or something, he's always on the infomercials. But I think he's just complaining about the ground and how we could do an improvement on the ground but if we had a lounge chair that was kind of kinematically uh, assisting us with uh, some springs or levers. Luckily he's got one for sale, $200. So what are the most deadly machines? Probably farm, farm material, like tractors kill people. Half of tractor deaths are because the tractor topples over and has no roll bar regulation. Sure, certainly machines are, are the deadliest, but uh, in the same vein as how machine, or uh, certainly uh, automobiles are the deadliest. But in the same vein of, of automobiles is also the vending machine, because uh, the vending machine counts for like 40 deaths a year. 
or is it? Oh no, it's it's only forty deaths altogether so far in three a year in America, perhaps. And I don't know, just like the the the, the vehicles, automobile, automobiles, uh, the deaths by vending machines are are usually related to kind of like greed or like misuse. They're built like a tank so no one can steal them, but a lot of people end up just uh, being crushed under them if they're trying to shake food loose. Uh, it turns out the Bowflex is like the, the bastard child of the Solo Flex. I haven't, I haven't checked out what the Solo Flex does. But it's probably like the, the grandfather of all exercise machines. I took a Bowflex apart last year. Had those uh, long rods that had different weight tensions on it. Seems like a, a pretty big choking hazard if you had kids around the house. But I think uh, what they're going for is getting rid of getting rid of free weights, getting rid of the heavy thud of uh, you know pure iron, and trying to go for for spring tension. Probably just to reinvent the wheel so that people could uh, buy it, buy another one. There's a, a thigh master in, in the classroom if you wanted to use it for any kin kinematic work. There's also these uh, these strange oscillating weights. That one in particular is, is on like the the worst fitness stuff ever kind of kind of list, where you just have a kind of like spring and two weights. And then you just shake it and it just looks kind of how you do. You have this other one where it's just like two red balls and then there's like a string between them. And it's just like a power ball, which is a, a gyro ball. I, I, I totally don't know if yours. But uh, this, this spring one, you know, it just builds up torque and tension because uh, the more you use it, the kind of like the more torque it builds up versus you. But the gyroscope is pretty cool. They even have ones that have uh, self-powering inside of them. Self-powered uh, lights. So you use a string to start it up like a yo-yo, and then it has this internal gyro that just keeps rotating. And it's great, because you get it powered up, and then you just stop it, and then it's still, the, the gyro is still twerking against your hand. Probably, probably great. I, I use it for, for carpal tunnel situations. In the, the diagrams for some of these machines, they'll, they'll try to infer that you're going to get kind of like kinematic uh, activation, that the machine's going to promote you to, you know, develop these certain directions of, of empowerment. So straight out of uh, the movie Animatrix, just a, a fiction about the future of the machines, which we, we we're closing in on a little bit, is uh, there's this machine named uh, B166ER, and he's just like a domestic servant kind of machine. You know, he probably looks like a human, walks around the house, cleans up desks and stuff. They're making movies about characters like this these days. There's a movie a couple years ago where like an older guy was given a robot to like help take care of him because he's like getting close to the end of his life, and then the robot's trying to convince him not to eat red meat. And then there's just dialogues in the movie between the android and the, the old man about dealing with you know the two sides of the situation where one's mortal and crotchety, and the other one's like an infinite guide that knows everything that's right because it's been programmed by the distilled wisdom of society. Also the the yeah, what, what's his deal? I'd like to see what the, the ethic was that they're trying to instill. Looks like he started fires accidentally.
Yeah, no, uh, no machine cartoon uh, montages done without going to the junkyard. It's sort of like uh, the Hades of, of machines. So this machine in the Animatrix animated series, he, uh, he kills his honor, but he's sentient enough to say, like he goes on trial and he's like, I killed him because I was afraid for my life. And you know, the machine starts saying that, so you're at a certain point. And uh, you know, it's fiction, but in the, uh, the movie, they, uh, in the court, they, they quote an old uh, African-American uh, uh, closing statement that might have been in 1856 about how like African-Americans Aren't, weren't meant to be considered citizens kind of stuff. And then, and then uh, in the court they say, don't make the same mistake twice, you know, don't, don't reference a rule that's obviously bigoted. And then there's, there's revolt and machines and sympathizers are upset and, you know, end of society as we know it. So here's the, the, the reading. We think that, that they are not, we, we never intended them to be included as the, in the quote, concept of citizens in the Constitution, therefore not claim none of the rights, which the instrument provides for uh, any securities for U.S. citizens. At the time, they are considered subordinate and inferior class beings. All right, so that's, that's fiction. But nonfiction, I was uh, looking up what, what uh, actual lawyers are doing while, while they're approaching this threshold. And, and sadly, they don't even have any reason to even consider it ethically. There's, there's no musing about, um, you know, the, the oddities of life. All they're saying is, let's just turn it into an insurance policy. When you get a machine that's a little bit more complicated than, than your personal awareness, you know, you can't, you can't uh, repair it, you, you can't sympathize it with it if it goes haywire. Just make sure that you have lots of insurance. That way, if you get killed by it, then at least there's this big pool of money set aside for you that's sadly, you know, how, how money's kind of like equivalent to like ethical uh, debt, so a, a company just has to make sure that there's enough money to, to pay off uh, for for what what damage you know and the one percent of of accidents uh, that people need to be reimbursed for their their faulty faulty mechanics. So here's the the quote from them: creating a legal framework around the ultimate machine that in itself has economic value. It can be argued that the ultimate insurance machine emancipates the machine. After all, machines, or at least the men behind the machines, are liberated. The requirement for liberation is, however, that machines have a mandatory insurance, and through that insurance, a, a, a tight link to the liability stock market. So if you just commodify risk, then you don't even have to ask about, like, why are we putting ourselves through this risk, or, or who are the sources, you know? Just, just make sure there's, there's money to protect it. So, I don't know, philosophers are kind of left in the, in the mud on that one. Here's a, what OSHA is saying about uh, deaths in like 2006 in America, I think. This might be the museum. I, ch I took some stats from a couple different places. But, but luckily, if you roll, roll some dice long enough, you, you end up just getting all the numbers. Uh, my friend in the steelworking business, uh, he gets his steelworking magazine every, every month. And in the back of it, there's just a list of another 50 people that have died because they fell off a, a building or got crushed. So construction and uh, forestry lumped in with agriculture and hunting. And then, of course, transportation. There's this uh, blog I found that uh, declared uh, kind of like a study of the rise of machines by looking at all of the safety stickers that we leave around our machines to make sure that, you know, you, you get along well with them, that they don't, they don't do you wrong. And so think about the ethic of some of these, these uh, instructions. Hazardous voltage, rotating parts. Everyone's got uh, the body parts of the human being incorrectly uh, in input into the machines. This one gives an anthropomorphic uh, representation of electricity because it's out to get us. Here's a human being uh, spindled around. It's crushed. And then they're starting to make ones like this where uh, like slightly sentient kind of robots. 
So if you see a sign like this and you walk into the space, you know, you just signed your, your lease for, for being alive. Perhaps. And then this one says, keep caution, don't, uh, ma like, keep, like, caution, watch out, don't hurt this machine. Never mind any, any human being importantly uh, damaged, you know? So it says strictly the machine, all of the machine declares is that it doesn't want to be hurt. Here's a here's straight up just telling you, uh, this this robot grabs stuff and you could be on its list. So they never want to mention anything about fatalities. That stuff probably gets censored a bit. Company lobbies just have to cover those up because you couldn't sell your your newest gear with with uh, a list of death tolls. But uh, this, this site just gives you like warnings about these six different machines that are just like the, the most dangerous ones you can use in, uh, in a gym. Which is strange, you know, your gyms are for uh, exercise, but a lot of these machines, they end up just making it so you have to get surgery prematurely. Uh, my mom likes to use treadmills these days, but she used to use some kind of uh, squatting or, or in the knee pressure um, machine. And, you know, after doing that for five, ten years, then your, your knees are blown and the machine practically just kind of uh, dismantled you. So she had to have a third surgery and, and, and after, after the fact kind of realized, you know, they say, well, it's probably because you're doing all that uh, mechanical interaction, you know? These machines that we were told to save us are actually damaging us, kind of stuff. Here's a list of... Uh, the other place where you can get information about what machines are killing people is uh, you go to attorneys' websites, and they're all smiling, saying, "We'll we'll help you. We'll protect you from those machines that have already damaged you with a good settlement." And the ones that they're seeing often, obviously, I think on the the, the top of it's like the wood chipper, forklifts, cranes, presses, lasers, grinders, mixers, backhoes, drill presses. So the caliber of machine these days is uh, just beyond, like, if it touches you, then you get a, a pokey. It's uh, lacerations that can just whip, whip the body in half. If you ever watch that, uh, that show, World's Deadliest Catch, it's, it's kind of a hilarious dialogue between humans and machines and, and uh, the environment, where uh, these, these guys, you know, you, you know how every piece of heavy machinery says, don't operate this unless you've got, you know, sleep and sanity. But these guys, their job mostly is to be on like 48 hour shifts out on like the slipperiest ice decks, uh, working with like half of those uh, deadly instruments to, to bring up, you know, a, a ton of crabs from, from every one of the, the pulley ropes. And so people die if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, they get sliced and stuff like that. It's, it's, uh, it's the only reason why that they get like uh, $50,000 for about one or two months work. Occupational injury from machinery is ranked third after motor vehicle and homicide as cause of death. So it's, it seems like, I don't know, the top three killers are from transportation machines, occupational machines, and I don't know, forever, for whatever reason, maybe it's good or bad, but humans are still in the top three. You know, humans kill humans too. But, but what, what would happen if, if that wasn't true. Like, if we kind of erased you know, humans from from being like a, a danger, and then it was, it was just pure machine, it'd be kind of weird. Oh yeah, in, uh, in the domestic world, there's there's lots of examples. Twenty three children fell from <clears throat> washing machines while in a baby seat. You leave a kid on top of a washing machine, it vibrates. It does a somatic experiment and the kid ends up on the ground toppled or concussion. But just, uh, it's a strange realization, like the microwave in everyone's house, if you disable the, the door uh, lock so that it's still the ability to be in the on position when it, the door is open, you can uh, irradiate you know, your body to cause you know, like immediate uh, burns or uh, What's been done back in the, the 50s with the first microwaves, perhaps, was uh, the safety mechanisms weren't very good, so you could automatically disable them. 
and then you could just have the microwave pointed at the TV, and then the TV will start uh, doing weird uh, inter interactive phasing with the radiation coming out of the microwave. So before before there was a safety involved, there was kind of creative art. Roller coasters kill only three people, four people per year. So roller coasters kill the same amount of people as vending machines. Whereas uh, texting kills 6,000 annually. Uh, in, along the line of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and work repetitive injury, there are pieces of software out there that um, supposedly are, are going to make our lives more easy. What, what's wrong with repetition? Well, humans don't need repetition. We need to exist on like, a hierarchical level where the robots are doing all the repetitions. We're the managers, supposedly. In the new version of the Willy Wonka movie, the Charlie's dad used to work as a toothpaste uh, factory tube uh, screw top uh, connector. So all you do all day is repetitive stress. And then, supposedly, you know, movies end well, and he gets a job. Um, being the repairman for the automatic uh, toothpaste uh, top screw. What, a, what an upgrade. So the whole concept of macros, it's, it's embedded in Photoshop if you ever have to work as a graphic designer. If you have a batch where you have an, um, a picture and you have to do the same seven to a thousand uh, methodical processes to it, to get where you need it, then you just go to your macros, you go to your actions, you record it once, and then it just plays out for each one. So just one click, or just one, one batch operation does all of the tedious chores for you. And of course the, the algorithms are still a little bit contextual, and it's really easy to like run an algorithm on the second picture that's a little bit different size, and then it gets damaged because uh, all of the like relative points that it was, it was uh, interacting on it are, you know, just not in the same context. And, and so it's good and bad. Macros make the work process flow better, but it also makes it uh, more dreary because the exact same thing is going to always happen. So it's going to make kind of kind of boring, repetitive art, as well as uh, if the algorithms aren't smart enough, then it's just going to damage the materials if they have slightly different contexts. So repetitive stress uh, injury, R RSI. Modern phenomenon, and by that it was first documented when industrial workers existed in Italy in the 1700s. And industrial workers again got carpal tunnel in the 1850s, and factory workers in the 1895. So it's a, it's a class of industrial, you know, they call it industrial healthcare. Practically, uh, instead of uh, a physician specializing in the human uh, health situation, it's more uh, the, the industrial healthcare is for uh, work-related injuries. So it's all this whole slew of injuries that never existed for, for humans in a vacuum. But uh, as soon as they're kind of... Uh, interfaced with or interlocked in mechanical systems, then, then we have new ways of getting damaged. Um, it's a new invigoration of the, the Frankenstein theme, this uh, character Deathlock in a, a new girl version called Deathlocket. They're, they're just new Frankensteins, they're just uh, people that died that were uh, offered cybernetic parts so that they could become super soldiers or brought back to life. So the trope's alive and well, somewhere between biology and mechanics. So, uh, yeah, the Wikipedia on uh, Ludites. Here's the, that toaster hater, a fictitious uh, cult group.
But um, the first reason I really wanted to talk about fitness for our class today was because it's a the intersection between something that humans need and something that machines can offer. All these different exercises for like the different physiological system we have. And each one of these is these model uh, play sets for adults is, is a different kind of, kind of cathartic experience, like almost a, a therapy you can have, a mechanical therapy. There is an X Fitness site here in town. It's up at the top of the San Lorenzo River, where like the top of Ocean Street across from the, the pet smart. I'll show you some video of what they've got there. So this, this play equipment, it's great because it's for adults, it's a gym, it's a, you don't have to pay, you just walk up to the machines, they're, they're weatherproof, they're just left in public spaces and they have just few enough uh, safety hazards. Here's times two speed full screen. Is a ten thousand dollar playset to get five or six of these uh, kinetic toys and facilitate, you know, five people's exercise of their own. I, I sent them an email. This X Fitness company. I sent them an email saying that this one's broken. I think some people uh, had a little bit too much fun on it, but I'm pretty sure that the uh, elliptical is supposed to go in the ellipse if, if you're if you're good enough or if it hasn't been damaged. You know, like why put a circle there unless you can get all the way around the circle? Talk about an intersection between uh, art and technology and uh, consumer products. It is a, a company that invents kind of like a modular playset that they, they can just commission, be commissioned by any town to be put it in public public space. And they went with a little bit of a you know like a Calder Mobile feel. Each piece is kind of like a stable. They go into their website and they have got um, 3D catted versions of all the different play sets that they offer. So what a fun job is just inventing uh, new dynamic motion tools. So uh, assembly instructions. I like to think that uh, underneath in, inside of the treasure troves of files that all of these different uh, mechanical factory firms, there's just uh, an unending amount of uh, intellectual data. Simplest way to get them, go to a tool website. Let's see, let's see, what looks good? How does this one work? Well, they'll tell you.
on the last page of every every product product manual, for something that's complicated enough, they'll give you a, a diagram for assembly in case you go it alone to try to reassemble it. This stuff right here. It's my favorite. The exploded version of the machine. So you can see the website right here. Uh, I saw this last week and I was like, oh, well this means that everything is automatically downloadable because they tell you exactly how things are organized. So I made a computer program that you can see that they're uh, part numbers, they go from zero to about 70,000. So I had a computer program just look at every single one of those uh, product lists. Oh, just for random facts, uh, it turned out there's only like 6,000 different product manuals that actually existed out of the 60,000 different uh, numbers. So my computer just downloaded like a bunk 12 kilobyte file for each one that didn't exist. I threw those away. Um, then I ran my, uh, my transform program that dilates the, the pictures. Because it gives them more of an aesthetic feel. Looks kind of like Aboriginal art at this point. I think I got about a hundred, I just snapshotted the, the diagrams for about a hundred of these mechanisms. And I found out a little bit about the history of the company. I found out that they did CNC mills for a while before they probably had to stop because if you're going to sell shoddy tools, you know, it's the same thing we're always up against. It's like the, it's a certain type of singularity. It's like, if you're trying to make a me uh, mechanical system of a certain, you know, technological advancements, but you're also like a shoddy tool company, you're going to run into these these lemon products. You know, it's, it's a great idea that everyone would have a CNC mill in their home. But if you're going to cut corners on, on its fabrication and leave like the, the steel burrs inside of the machine instead of, you know, really well designing it, then you're going to get all of them back in the, uh, the repairs uh, office. And, and at, at the end of the day, you're not, not going to have any, made any money. So there's, there's different ethics for a uh, for assembly and, and fabrication. I think uh, Japan's known for the best one. M M Japan used to have really, really shoddy uh, mechanical uh, exports, maybe back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then, maybe not single-handedly, but definitely as like the, the, the battle flag kind of character, there's this guy named Dr. Deming. And he was hired he was like the, the new age uh, Taylor or, or Gilbreth who was hired to kind of be, a, be an outside uh, interloper on like Suzuki and Toyota and come in and say like, well, how can we make things better? And so he just kind of defined like how factory work is done. It used to be this uh, kind of feedback loop, hardly even a feedback loop, just a straight line where you design it, you build it, you sell it, and then you have to do repairs. So, and what would repairs be? Repairs come back, it's like, well, if it's sort of salvageable, we'll put it in file, things are sort of salvageable, or just throw it away and then just send a new one. So oftentimes, you might have to send, you know, like repairs not even worth doing. And you have to send out like two or three of, of a Britain model, say like a $10 machine, to a particular person that has a lemon, you know, you're going to get a $30 worth of merchandise. But what Deming said is that we should kind of close the loop. And uh, anytime that anything ever goes wrong on like a Deming factory line, they, they stop the whole factory line and solve the problem. Where it's more of a Ford kind of American, I always like to think of it as like putting duct tape on uh, your, your engine, you know, you got a leak in your, in your house, we'll just put duct tape on it. And maybe like a, a more expedited kind of uh, factory process, uh, design it, build it, and sell it. You know, lots of us just saying. But uh, for Deming, anytime anything goes wrong, you, you stop and you find out what the problem is. And anytime you get a repair back, you you take that repair, and then you, you go back to the guys that are doing the design, and you, you make sure that you modify the design so that the problem with these, these repairs we're getting uh, isn't in the next line of product. So it's sort of like a team evolution. 
Now, what this means is that originally we have to have you know, designers and builders and sellers and uh, returners or repairmen. But with the demming process, you spend so much more work on design and building that there is no repair. There is no repair uh, wing of your company. You make a product that's so good that it doesn't have to come back to you. So, uh, for whatever reasons, he's got his. Uh, you know his acronym, plan, do, check, act, kind of kind of methodical thinking about how to get things done instead of just slap dash it together, sell it, and hope it doesn't come back. He's considered a national hero in, in Japan because of uh, the alterations he made to um, production efficiency and, and quality. And um, so with his introduction, there was unheard of levels of quality and productivity. And so 1950s changed everything where Japan, which has less, less, uh, less land than Nevada, turned into like the third biggest uh, economy in the world. Maybe just because this guy was there to help out at the right time. So just for the visual fun of it, uh, check out the Kinematics 10 and see all of these uh, factory diagrams. If there's a little dot that looks like a, a diamond, that means I was using the diamond mode on the dilator. If there's little dots that look like squares, that means I was using the square mode. I uh, printed all of these like 100 or 200 pictures in both modes. Ideally, they'd all be rollover images that were uh, synchronized so that it's in diamond until I roll over it and then it's in square mode and then you get a little a little flicker of, of difference between the like the spatial rules for making these these plots oh yeah and uh, to bring up an old concept that I mentioned to you about uh, bit bit operations you'll notice that there's like these uh, these ghosts on the corners occasionally there are dots that are like a little bit lower, uh, lower hue. And that's a result of the dilator program hitting the wall and then reflecting off of it. So it's a lot like in, in sound design where if you make a sound that's like 30,000 hertz but you're only listening in on a, a speaker or a microphone that knows what is it, what it means to be up to like 20,000 hertz, then the 30,000 hertz signal is, is going to end up looking like it's a, like a 10,000 hertz signal at half, half loudness, because that's what it actually is if uh, you can't see it just right, you get like a, an artifact in the same like division ratio of the original sound. So it's, it's happening visually here, where sometimes uh, the dilator reflects off the wall and then ends up reflecting back into the picture some, uh, some noise. I think these are better to look at a little smaller. Uh, the algorithm for these, it, uh, it you know, prints one and then when it, right before it prints the next one, it changes the hue just like by one or two ticks. So about by running through them all, you get kind of like a, a field, uh, like a spectrum transition. So what are these? The, most of them are like generators, rotor tillers, hand drills. At, at this, at this uh, distance, you can kind of see them pretty well. It'd be pretty fun to have access, you know, like this is like digital access to all of their product. But it'd be pretty fun, you know, dream come true to be like a, an intern or a, a artist in residence for, say, Harbor Crate or uh, another tool company. And you're just allowed, like, like all of these objects have part numbers. Like each thing's made of 100, 200 parts. 
and you'd just be allowed to go to like a factory that had every single part. And then you could just make uh, Frankenstein monsters out of all these uh, like electromechanical components. And what you're seeing with a lot of these lines, they always look like they're uh, kind of city, isometric cities. Those lines are just uh, to help guide you back out so that there's like a number, like number three, and then they s stick a little needle into the, the machine to tell you exactly where number three is located. But I've learned a lot from dismantling things, and uh, looking at the assembly instructions is kind of like having it dismantled for you. Only once or twice have I encountered a uh, mechanical device that I couldn't take apart. There's some riveting systems that are just like one way. But if usually if you search around the material, you'll find a, a secret latch or a screw that's just exactly what you need to get get the thing on unassembled. So down here, there's different <coughs> type of visual drawing. And uh, the way I'm tying these in is kind of an interesting idea is uh, assembly. Like those are all the assemblies for, for mechanical systems. But these are all the mechanical, these are all the assembly diagrams for digital systems. What these are is a, a type of video game that might predate the invention of the pixel a little bit. They're all for LCD screens, which used to be just uh, black versus white. And uh, it's a technological printing process where say, uh, we'll take like the MC Hammer guy. And so say this arm right here is a particular voltage zone. When it's given voltage by this hidden little trigger, then it turns black. So that means that I want MC Hammer to stand with his arms up, and I give a voltage to these uh, five zones. So somewhere in memory, if I'm going to write a video game, then uh, it's going to sound like, well, scan, uh, scan the character straight up and down. And that will say, like, channels to five different voltage zones. And then if I wanted to turn to the right, then I would have to drop this one and this one, and then turn on one that was above it and beside it. So, uh, computer program that runs these video games is just a bunch of uh, ons and offs for uh, a bunch of visual zones. Now from a graphic design perspective, it's, it's got some interesting possibilities and also some weaknesses. So there's modular characters. So here's Spider-Man. And he's got two arms, two legs. And he can be both of those characters. Uh, obviously not both at the same time. He could be uh, four different characters with lower right arm, upper left arm, lower left arm, right arm, right arm. Sometimes they will make it so that the head is removable. Turn that head off, turn this head off. So this character here maybe has, you know, like a permutation of uh, 500 different poses and he's just a, an unmoving icon on a screen. Now, historically, this, this looks a lot like stuff by Da Vinci, who might have been thinking about this first. You know, that MC Hammer looks a lot like uh, Vitruvius Man, where it's showing kind of like multiple possibilities of his expression in one still image. So it might, might be uh, that Da Vinci's Vitruvius who is a, a Greek, I mean a, a Roman 
engineer of, of you know, like 300 AD. Brought back to life because he's a, you know, he's like the Dr. Deming of the Renaissance. So just like at the end of every uh, assembly diagram, at the end of every uh, machine manual, at the end of every manual for these video games, there's this assembly diagram. It's called like the, the test. The test pose, or the reset pose, that way you can see that the whole screen works. The, the, um, the genre started with games that were a lot simpler. Like you can understand this one right here where you have control of like eight different gun positions and then from those eight positions you are allowed to shoot and then you know there's a ski shoot in the distance that you have to hit at the right time. Now the funny thing about this this game design model is that it gives you a visual uh, a visual system for your eyes to link to and but it's also got this logic system underneath it and it's the, the interaction between the logic and the, the visual that you don't see, but you have to feel to make this game happen. I'll show you some examples of gameplay, and it just it'll just boggle your mind, like how someone can consider this a game that's that's playable compared to what we're used to these days. I also want to show you this uh, this page right here for the Dracula character. You only fight Dracula once at the exact end of the game, and you, you got to think like, well. Here's the, the game's demo, the screen for the game. How can you fit a boss of a game in here that you're only going to see once? And as you can see, he's just a silhouette of a character. He's just a, little, a couple of dots. And so he's, he's hidden right in front of you the entire game. But only right at the final end of the game do they turn on those little electric zones that are uh, you know, infinitesimally small. So it, this, this kind of game design was all about uh, solving visual problems and, and condensing visual information. This one's a pretty good one. A lot of games have this mode where like, you have a character with a bunch of weapons here, here, and here, and you have to like, go to the right when a weapon's uh, being shot or an attack grab is coming towards your character. So there's lots of, lots of uh, multiplicities. Uh, as for modularity, like this one right here, this is like Pit Fighter or something. And strangely enough, like you can choose like what character you're playing, and they will like change the haircut. Here's the one for uh, Mortal Kombat. So every this is uh, four characters versus four characters, and every one of those characters is embedded in here, and it's just a matter of changing the, which haircut's uh, visual. Here's a two-headed Michael Jordan. And a lot of these games try to get you to the, give you the concept that you're like diving into the screen. And they'll do that by doing uh, like these repeating lines. They'll show these lines like uh, tracking down the screen so that you feel like you're, you're traveling up the screen. And then after you've played for a while, like here, then the baseball or the basketball hoop will like suddenly appear as if in the distance it's, it's approached you. Uh, this one right here, it says uh, Ryu, Gael, and uh, Ken, and then they are fighting versus Ihan, de Blanca, and Zangief. And if you look closely, like Ihan's hair is inside of Blanca's hair. But they really had to gamify lots and lots of stuff. Here's another example of uh, being on a virtual a football field, and then all these track lines make you think that you're kind of revolving to the left, revolving to the right, making progress or not. And then the goals would uh, suddenly appear. So pretty much every single one of these, like the, the newer versions, the, the newer ones, they had either these lines on the floor, or for this Batman game, you can see that there's these, uh, these wooden grates. They have something in the screen to help you realize that you're traveling through the screen. But they're, they're pretty shoddy, as, as cool as they are in a philosophical way. Like, here's Wolverine, all you can do is just jump up here and attack what's up here, or fall back down and jump up and attack what's here. Hopefully avoid enough bad timing situations to finally get to Magnum. 
the Paperboy one's pretty cool. All these modular things that you have to track through. Probably the most dynamic one I've seen is one for uh, Super Off-Road. Somewhere in within these regions. But the Super Off-Road one wants you to feel like you're, you're, you're traveling through um, the space. So there is a grid. And then your character, at any one point, has, has a, the track that's in front of them that's kind of showing itself like this. And then you have to press, say, like this would move down. And then you encounter this part, and then a new part would be un un uncovered for you. Your next move. So ones that are designed to travel through a space. I got three examples of it. One you'll surprise you'll be surprised to see that uh, it stars Mario back in the eighty three. Here's a cement factory where uh, those graphics of cement get dropped down into the barrels and you have to methodically not fall down on the, the middle conveyor belts while you're allowing things to fall through the screen. And then the truckers are waiting patiently. But the, uh, this predates like Super Mario 1, but it has the same concept where you have to kind of walk across vertical, vertical conveyor belts. So you, you probably never thought that uh, Mario you know, he obviously he's a plumber, but he also worked in a cement factory. And he still kind of was working in a cement factory when they came out with uh, his first feature game. I came across this, uh, this Frogger console at the bargain barn. It's a pretty cool little timing mechanism. I don't know if these guys are clear, but it's all about the intersection. What you don't see is what what, what counters. The frog is right here. There's a little pad right here. You're allowed to jump to it. If there's a car here. Every every tick of the clock, maybe every two ticks. The uh, components are allowed to change their, their on screen position. So if your frog is standing here, when a transition happens where if instead of a, a, like a darkness and lily pad on an empty street, as soon as the, uh, the truck is in this position and you're in this position, then you know, it's over. But, uh, but the, the subtle timing of it is, is pretty crazy where you can be in this position and then like at the exact same time, you can press up that the car moves there, and then the next image is here, here, and the car is here. And so you can play really fast. In fact, uh, I don't know if I can find it today, but there's a really cool video of uh, an artificial intelligence program running, running some, some slick statistics that's uh, playing Pac-Man and other early video games. And the the algorithm has has like you know lightning thumbs. It can play specifically every every frame. It can make a new choice. And so you see the, the Pac-Man character, and he's just like dodging the ghosts with like impeccable uh, dexterity. He can like go like one pixel in front of, and then go up, and then go one pixel behind the ghost. It's it's a move that you never see a, an all player ever uh, accomplish. But that particular uh, program was written uh, merely by giving the, the, like the program that was playing the game access to the memory states of the game. And then doing statistical analysis of, well, like the memory state of like positions as well as score and lives and time. Just trying to, to rattle loose like uh, the equation for how I'm supposed to play most efficiently versus all of these numbers.
The, the first two companies to do this were uh, the Game & Watch from Nintendo, that predated the Nintendo Entertainment System, as well as uh, Tiger LCD did it. Here's a new version that's trying to rip off the, the Game Boy Advanced, where you take these little cartridges that also have the, uh, the LCD screens in them, and then just pop them in. It's hilarious, this guy plays uh, the games like one every five seconds because that's how, how much attention span people have for them these days. But it's strangely uh, almost like a, a persistence of, of vision uh, dilemma. Trying to convince yourself that you're, you're inhabiting this this modular space as, as a character versus versus opponent. This guy's sure, sure troubled by the uh, the learning curve. Well, on that game, you saw that the, uh, the characters were flying across, and then there was a silhouette around each character that was that character's explosion. But these days, the future of this is uh, tapestries. They're coming out with this new thing called the organic LED, and uh, We've already got electric conductive paint. It takes a little bit of effort to be able to connect, say, like a, a silver wire to all the different zones that a game could have. But you could uh, you can make one of these with a couple hundred dollars on, a, let's say, like a copper plate. And then you have to run a wire to a micro processor or a computer for each one of these zones and then uh, make a synchronized uh, logic system that ran it. And at that point it'd be pretty cool because then you could convince yourself that you're playing a game when you're actually just looking at a piece of fabric on the wall that's just got electricity flowing through it. So I guess uh, we'll try to close out with listening to a little bit of Susan Blackmore's talk. By the time you realise what's happening, the child is a toddler up and causing havoc, and it's too late to put it back. We humans are Earth's Pandoran species. We're the ones who let the second replicator out of its box, and we can't push it back in. We're seeing the consequences all around us now. That, I suggest, is the view that comes out of taking memetics seriously. And it gives us a new way of thinking about not only what's going on on our planet, but what might be going on elsewhere in the cosmos. So first of all, I'd like to say something about memetics and the theory of memes. And secondly, how this might answer questions about who's out there, if indeed anyone is. So memetics. Memetics is founded on the principle